We are going. Word. Aloha. Um, so uh, I guess I'll start off just by, uh, yeah, giving some some pre, some, some backstory. Um, so I grew up in a, a uh, non-denominational, um, an offshoot of Calvary Chapel. Um, and so charismatic, but also not charismatic at the same time. Um, the more that the, the, not the, the super charismatic end of charismatic yeah. or continuationist um, maybe. I don't yeah. Know. Yeah, definitely a, a, a focus on the spirit and, um, you know, spiritual gifts and, and a lot of that, but not emphasized or yeah, it's still, you know, closer to a Baptist or a, a Calvinist or, you know, reformed kind. Um, sure. but, uh, grew up in that. Um, my dad was an elder and, uh, I have two older brothers. I'm the youngest of three. Um, growing up in church, I was very involved. Um, I grew up out in the woods. And so I was a bit of, um, by myself, my older brothers are both older than me. And so, um, yeah, I grew up a bit, uh, doing my own thing out in the woods and, you know, in nature. And, um, and then as far as uh, my Christian faith went, it was pretty real early on, um, like in third grade or so, somewhere around there, I, uh, I wanted to be a pastor and, you know, like my, uh, I think it was like a talent show or maybe like a show and tell or something like that. Uh, I think it was a talent thing. Um, I gave a sermon <laughs> to my class. <laughs> Don't see that <laughs> little, every day. Yeah, it was definitely interesting. Um, I'm probably not great, but yeah, third third grader kind. Um, so yeah, it was it was real in a certain way from a young age, um, but I was also very sheltered from the world and was very uh, yeah didn't didn't know much, didn't think about it too much, and didn't have any questions or any doubts or any influences giving those things. But as I got a bit older, as I got into high school, um, both I started to hang out with like older kids more and started to, to make bad decisions and whatnot. But at the same time, I, um, I started to question the faith and started to like, um, I guess a credo questioning the faith, mm. um, you know, the, the legitimacy of the Bible and, and different stuff like that. Um, and so that continued and kind of grew and grew and didn't, 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 uh, nothing, it wasn't dealt with. It was just kind of there. Um, oh, and apart from my church, which was like Calvary Chapel offshoot, um, non-denominational kind, I went to a private school that was a first Baptist church and was involved with like a harvest Baptist. So, um, very, not very, the Harvest Baptist was very fundamental, but the, the, the school I went to is pretty, uh, fundamental legalistic. Uh, we didn't have like strict dress codes and stuff like that. Um, or we had dress codes. We didn't have uniforms and stuff like that, but yeah, very, very fundamental, um, more of an academic school as well. Um, and that had a negative effect on my life and a lot of people in my, my, my grade and the grades around. Um, a lot of people walked away after high school. Mm. Um, so yeah, that was a, a thing as well that I think caused a lot of it was looking at what I was being taught in school. The, my, the church that I grew up in was a good church, is a good church. But I was only there one day a week or two days a week to where going to a private school, Christian school, it's every day, most of the day. Yep. Um, and so that was the main Christian influence in my life outside of my family, because my family was Christian and um, not just in like it was a real faith um, for my parents. Um, so, yeah, 
getting towards the end of high school, really started to get more and more rebellious and really started to believe less and less in the faith. Eventually, my, uh, probably my senior year, but after my senior year, um, I had dropped out of high school. And, um, but at that point, I had pretty much walked away from the faith. Um, and, um, and throughout these, this, this time, I'm, uh, there's a, I guess we can link a, um, that conversation with Job. Um, so people get a, a little more laid out narrative uh, version of this. And, uh, and then there's also, I, I had a little talk with PVK and some others, um, Jacob and um, someone else uh, for the homeless, homeless crisis yeah. panel thing. And so yeah. I laid out some of my story in that as well. So it's kind of a mosaic of my story in those. Mm -hmm. uh, so as I started to walk away from the faith, I was still, you know, agnostic, I guess. Um, I was still growing up in Southern Oregon. Uh, this is the land of the hippie, the real, the real hippie. Like there's some weird, it's a weird place, um, especially Southern Oregon. It's a bit more real and more lived than like Portland or Eugene, you know, hmm. ideologically hippie. Um, it's more communes and stuff down here. And yeah. Uh, so with that, I, um, as I departed from Christianity, I didn't lose my, you, uh, like I didn't become a, an atheist, um, especially new atheist, um, always grown up out in the woods and stuff was always tied to nature and was always just like, there's something that created this there's there's something more going on and so there was some some level of walking away was rebellion and and being done with it and wanting to do whatever i wanted to do but some of it was also wanting to find truth and and being on a quest um a spiritual quest or a religious quest more so that 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 looked like um looking into like, you know, the usual stuff, looking into Buddhism and, and new age kind, and um, just kind of a, an overall mystical outlook on stuff. And um, with that, that kind of paired very well with psychedelic drug use. Um, there's a bit of like a, a, a romanticness to it at the time, definitely of like, just the whole like universe thing or source or, you know, um, to where you're, you think you're getting out of the game or you're, you think you, you're playing a different game than, than the Christian one you grew up in, but like you're, you're kidding yourself. Like it's yeah. kind of, is that, hmm. um, and that went for a couple of years, um, went pretty deep into that. Not, I didn't go pretty deep into that, but pretty, pretty wild years and went pretty off, off the rails and, um, ended up, um, getting arrested and for some stuff and had to, to figure some life stuff out. And then, um, that's where Job's conversation ends. And my testimony kind of begins after that. Um, but to focus on, I guess, to focus on that, that earlier time, um, we can go through some uh, experiences that um, I had um, with psychedelics uh, specifically. Um, I guess the first, I'm trying to think of like the, what the first one I did was, um, it was probably, uh, probably mushrooms. Um, well, I mean, as far as like a, a, a legitimate psychedelic, um, mm. which it was very strange. <laughs> I don't think people quite understand the whole um, like getting your mind blown or, or the word trippy. It's like, no, like if, if 
things are trippy. You, you don't, you can't understand stuff. It's, it's a really strange, our brains are so crazy. And that was a lot of what I think mushrooms did for me was this weird looking at stuff more deeply um, or a little bit of like a, a switch getting clicked on of like the enchantment of things. Um, and a, a unique one of that is uh, that me and others experienced, I was thinking about the other night, is looking at the sky, looking at the night sky. The strangest thing about it was that it would always be round or like uh, domed. Like you could see that curvature almost. Mm -hmm. It was very strange in that way. And it was every time I did it, it was like that. Um, as far as a, a mystical experience with, with mushrooms goes, it was more like, it was more foundational or not foundational, but like I was saying, like a, a, a switch got clicked on. Um, it wasn't as much this like obvious explicit experience, but was more the the back end was getting worked on and re not rewired but just kind of shaken up it's like a different um, set of filters maybe yeah and and things like the the lasting side of it is that it you think differently um like it engages you in a different way and once you start thinking that differently you don't like it doesn't stop once you're sober or something like that, like you've kind of taken some blinders back a bit in a way. Um, or at least my experience was that way. Uh, and um, a lot of, a lot of with shrooms was, was going, was more seeking like a good time or something like that. Um, but now to kind of, this is going to be a weird video as far as timeline goes. It's hard to do that. But now um, I will still, I actually still, so I'm a, I'm a Christian. That's one thing with Job's video. It doesn't get to my testimony. And so it's like, people think I'm probably still this crazy dude. But uh, being a Christian and being, you know, uh, a follower of Christ and, and a servant and uh, a disciple, um, I'm a, I'm an interesting person and I probably make decisions that people would question or disagree with. Um, but when my friends, um, do mushrooms now, um, I act as basically the shaman of the group, um, mm -hmm. and will a, I'm there to like, because I'm a, I'm a, a lot more experienced in these things than my friends are. Um, cause I got into these things when at the, at the end of high school and right afterward to where for them, it didn't happen as much. And it's more recently that they've, and so, um, I've seen and have been reassured. I feel, um, by the spirit that my role in these times is to, uh, protect them and to, um, help them, um, and and try to you know turn it or 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 steer it in a in a good direction and in a uh fruitful direction not just in having a good time or whatever but like making sure that we're discussing things or you know trying to to go that route um but with it i will always take a little bit it's because there's something with there's something with psychedelics or at least with shrooms, especially that, um, you, there's a connection that occurs. Whoever's, whoever did it with you or like, you know what I mean? That, that kind of thing, there's a, an actual, you're on a similar wavelength, um, in like a natural or like a materialist way. Um, not in just a wooey kind of way. Like there's a weird thing that occurs that you, you, you sync up. And so um, I will always make sure to take just a, a tiny bit just to make sure that I am uh, sinking, I guess. 
um, so as to best do that. But it's not a common thing as well, though. Um, but it is a role that I've stepped into in these post crazy years times. Um, um, with, with, I guess we'll get acid out of the way real quick. Um, the first time I ever did acid, um, was I was at a party at my friend's house and it was just kind of a kickback party. I was like 18 or so. They were a bit older than me, a couple of years older and were kind of, I was like the little brother of the group. And they ended up by the end of the night, I was, you know, drinking, smoking throughout the night. And um, one of them decided that it was my time to, to be initiated into this, basically. And so they all brought me back in. They're all doing it. And they, they brought me back into this shed. Um, and I didn't take that much. Um, they were protective of me in that way. Uh, but yeah, then I, I went back to the party and was just hanging out and stuff and stopped drinking and stuff that night um because i was gonna have to drive home eventually which just took a hit of acid dummy <laughs> good um, luck <laughs> yeah but the weird thing was that i never felt anything um but i didn't feel drinking or smoking either that was a weird side that it like kind of canceled out it felt like um in a strange way i was kind of sober so eventually two three hours goes by still didn't felt anything and so i'm like all right i'm feeling fine now um i never drank that much anyways and so it wasn't you know just i can't drink that much even back then when i was crazy i would get sick pretty quick um so i decided i had work early in the morning i was gonna go home um at that point i was living in jacksonville oregon which is an old uh, gold rush mining town. Um, pretty cool, but it's very old and there's a lot of old buildings. And I was living in this cottage that was from that time. So a lot of history had been lit, then had or occurred in this cottage. It was like a rectangular building, one floor, and then one floor, the kitchen downstairs and just a big loft upstairs. I was supposed to live there with a buddy, but it didn't work out. And so the whole month that I lived there, it was just me. And every single day that I lived there, you'd, you, I'd, I'd get home from work. And as soon as I pulled in, I'd feel, like palpably feel um, a presence there. Like I was not alone. Mm. And you would hear many people, whoever came over or had been in that place before, if you were downstairs, you would hear walking around upstairs or a window shut upstairs. If you were upstairs, you'd hear a door slam downstairs or some stuff happening downstairs. And you'd go down or you'd go up and nothing would be there and nothing would be, you know, could have done this stuff. So every day I'd get there, it'd be an eerie feeling. So back to this first time doing acid, I, um, not feeling it at all. It's been like two, three hours. So it should have totally been in my system and I should have been tripping if I was going to trip. Go home, pull in, get the feeling again. I'm like, whatever, just get in, go to sleep and make myself some food, go upstairs and end up um, laying in my bed with the light on. And I can just feel slowly but surely this growing presence coming up the stairs. Um, not good kind presence and it just gets stronger and stronger and stronger coming from the stairs and finally it's just like unbearable and i'm just like i need to do, i need to deal with this like i'm just gonna go turn off the light and go to bed you know as soon as i get to the the light switch was right by the staircase i see at the bottom of the stairs this black figure just like whoosh down which you know could be whatever um I'll leave, leave these kinds of things open to that. But as soon as I click the light switch off and turn to go back to my bed, like quickly, I feel it instantly coming back up the stairs. And so I just beeline to my bed and kind of in like a little kid, um, you know, 
put the covers over they can't harm you kind of thing mm -hmm. i was just like got like laid down quick and just like closed my eyes because like i didn't want to see whatever was there um and instantly it was just right above me and i could just feel it just bearing down on me in a not good way in a in a terrifying petrifying way um and soon enough as the weirdest part of it um soon enough i could feel tangibly on my neck breathing on the whatever the kind that was there just i could feel the breath on my neck which was a crazy experience um not good and that was the last i believe that was the last night maybe like stayed stayed maybe one more day in that cottage and was just like nope done with this one month was fine it's obvious my homie's not going to move out here so we're done um but i feel that that was a with psychedelics you have there is something to the gateway to the metaphysical kind uh lens that people look at psychedelics as um and i think that that was basically what had occurred um maybe i was just tripping maybe it was just some like super four hours later it finally kicks in or whatever but um and when we get to, to dmt this will be discussed again but um yeah it it opens in a way um or it maybe it brings together the the divide between the the metaphysical and the physical um or yeah because it wasn't i don't know so that that was a an experience that um was negative for sure but thinking upon it now um was kind of positive or was kind of good i guess it was a negative good in that it was a It, like it was pointing me away from further away from like a new atheist stance you know like it, it was a even amidst rebellion and crazy years and that kind of stuff it was a reminder of like now we live in a really weird place like this is a very strange experience and it can get even stranger um and so that it, it did serve a purpose in that way um the only other time I can, I think, oh, I, one time on my birthday, my friends all decided that we were doing acid, which was kind of like, I didn't really want to, but it happened. So it's whatever. Um, and one of my friends had a really bad trip and was, was bad trip in the sense of like not seeing that happened on shrooms. I had a friend that the cliche, see the devil, all that kind of thing that more is more of a shroom thing to where this with acid was or with LSD was um, a paranoia and like a like an abyss that um, he had he had thought that he had screwed up and that this was going to be forever um, and that he had just changed himself and and was just in this terrible terrible place um, which was like the worst birthday ever <laughs> yeah <laughs> but finally and there was like a half there was like me and him and one other that actually did it and then everyone else there was just like partying and so it was this really not good environment that didn't work together um and so finally all those people left and eventually way late in the morning um i uh i was watching a video with ulysses who posts in the music uh discussion yeah um his recent interview that he just posted recently um he was discussing the power of music and about how uh the the like a medical use of it or like a uh psychiat psychiatric use of it um how it's it's strange how much music can affect us deeply and can heal us or orient us in a bad direction or a good direction um 
And eventually at the end of the night, he was just stuck in this. Like it had kind of faded as, as far as the, the drug had, had run its course for the most part. And so, but he was still stuck in this, this terrible place. And I finally came in and laid next to him and um, put on, I might, I think it was like Bob Marley, but it was some kind of reggae. It might've been Gregory Isaacs or some, uh, yeah, some kind roots reggae. Um, and it just almost instantly like reminded him of reality and and really we we tried all of us friends like tried talking him back you know at different points and it was just none of it could work but the song just cut through everything and just yanked him back and and that was when he looked at me like within 10 seconds of it playing he looked at me and he was actually looking at me um, to where before, like he was like past you. Um, and so that was an interesting experience as well. Um, and then the only other time was at um, Paradiso, which is up in Washington at this beautiful gorge. Um, it's a rave. Dumb experience for the most part. But the strange thing happened that... Um, I'd actually done quite a bit, which my body, it's a good, actually good thing to note with all of this, with all of these drugs and whatnot. Um, and even with drinking, like I had said, I'm kind of like a sickly dude in certain ways. And I'm kind of um, sensitive or maybe like on the spectrum in certain ways. And so that combination, like I couldn't go off the deep end the way that others could which was kind of like in the everyday, there's a lot of negative from those things. That's unfortunate. But as far as that goes, it prevented um, me from really going off. Um, but this one time I actually had done a good amount um, of LSD at this rave. And as it was like sitting up in the field down below is the stage and everything. And all of my friends, had gone down. I was watching all the stuff because I could not get into the music. Um, I was stuck in this frame of, of breaking down the event of like how you would throw a rave um, and was just like, this is how you do water better. This like just all of this stuff, this logistics, I just switched into this logistics mode very strangely and couldn't get into the music. And it was like a music festival. Um, so that was another weird, it took a while. It pretty much had to wear off before I could finally get into the music, um, which is very opposite of like the Grateful Dead and that whole, <laughs> yeah. that whole scene. Um, so that's LSD. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's, I'm not, and shrooms as well. Um, they're still with like micro dosing, um, psilocybin there's i i continue to be like oh i don't know like that's you know to be discussed to where yeah with lsd i'm not there's a risk in it and maybe not a long-term risk necessarily unless you're like touching a crystal or something like that but um it 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 didn't do anything in even like a spiritual sense like a mystical sense it wasn't that way um for me at least so like you never had a, any sort of spiritual experience on lsd specifically not not um not above what was already occurring or what how my brain already works you know because okay. like i was saying when i when i growing up out in the woods and by myself and stuff i doing shrooms recently doing shrooms being the shaman for my friends doing shrooms i realized that the way that i act soberly is the way that people act on shrooms <laughs> like oh, as far as like i'll notice like a a little bug and i'll just sit there and watch it for you know 10 minutes or something like that or you know just the weird or just weird thoughts or 
different things. It was kind of like, I don't know how to feel about this realization, if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but I'm seeing how I can be naturally kind of like that um, and notice little things and, and whatnot. So, so like really high on openness, maybe? Maybe, yeah. 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 And I've just always cherished little things as well. And I've always, I think the faith that was real when I was a child was this more mystical um, seeing God in everything. And um, yeah. So, so with LSD, there was, you know, always some level of that swirling within me because that was always swirling within me but not um explicitly or or all that much um not as much as shrooms was effective in that way or not even yeah not close to to dmt either um so i guess we can before we get into that i guess the first psychedelic i ever did was um what's it called uh crap what's it called um it's not spice it's a uh, salvia okay salvia is the worst it's ah oh, man uh it's like dmt and as far as like it's a short short jaunt and short and powerful kind of thing but um what i used to always say during that time was like if if dmt takes you to heaven salvia takes you to hell <laughs> mm. and it's mm. like it's just like stress it's not the same for everyone but it was for me it was and for if you look it up on the internet people are not having a good time when they record themselves like it's a weird experience a very weird yeah interesting so that's not, like not very pleasurable it's like consistently it's, not pleasurable for people or it's just so out of control that it's like it's just chaos um and so there's I, there is some like I remember one of the only things that I can the feeling wise I can remember from it was at one point later on finally as far as I'd gotten used to it and near coming down I was laughing um and in reality I was like laughing like hysterically um but in the the, the trip I was also laughing and as I was like sucking in air as I was belly laughing it felt like life or like like that was the the a good feeling in it um or a pleasurable feeling in it it was like but it was not life the weird the word which is strange that always came to me was gold like it was like swallowing gold but not i don't know it was very strange the rest of it was very stressful and bizarre like just the weirdest and you're kind of there like you you're fully in this new reality and you don't question you don't know that you just popped into this new reality like you've always been there as far as you're concerned in that so it's weird in that way that you're just kind of like instantly transported and then you're not yourself or you're yeah it's like a dream in that way um very dreamy very but but oh and then afterward you it would for a couple hours you wouldn't feel good um but once again you know maybe that's just me and my my body um so yeah not a fan of that very strange though very strange and there's it's it's good fodder for uh youtube videos yeah some... <laughs> i've never heard of i've never heard of salvia before and it's interesting yeah. that you're saying that a lot of people report more negative experiences with it and um, I think it's a, uh, maybe not, it might be a synthetic that, that might, you know, I'm looking it up to... here that says it's an herb in the mint family. Okay. We're you know, from Mexico. It's freaking wild. So <laughs> yeah, not illegal according to federal law, but several we're... states and countries, have... but whatever. So that was how we were able to, to sure. get it. Um, so, yeah, so with that, um, I guess we can move into uh, the DMT portion of this. 
um, which is which is the one that above all, and since my testament, like since since returning to the faith, um, I don't know what to do with it still, you know, mm-hmm. or I'm not that I don't know what to do with it. I guess at first it was more, I don't know what to do with this, but now I'm, it's just the one that I'm like, no, this one's a little bit different than the others. Um, and yeah, for m- multiple different reasons. Um, but so, so with my testimony um, in 2011, right after high school, um, a big part of that story and a part of my walking away from the faith was um, a close friend of mine, Kiana, uh, died in a car accident. Mm. And that was life altering, for sure. Um, But it's, it, it drew this point of like, even if you are real, I don't care. Like, I'm, you're not good. And so I'm not serving you. I'm not, I'm not with this whole thing. If if this is going to be the, you know, you, yeah, you get it. Um, And so that was a big, um, yeah, it was, it, it destroyed me. Sort of like, um, I guess it reminds me of, I don't know if you've read the brothers Karamazov, but I have not. Yeah. Well, it's just the, the sort of the famous speech that, Peterson has talked to about, um, you know, his, his Ivan, his brother is talking to Alyosha's little brother. And, you know, he basically says, even if God exists, I don't want a ticket to his yeah. heaven or whatever. So. Yeah. Yep. No, totally. E- exactly that. Um, and yeah. And, and was pretty volatile at the time. Um, was pretty over it in that way. Um, And with those, those same guys that, you know, initiated me in the, the LSD kind, um, they were all hippies and they're actually the reason that my testimony ended up happening in Hawaii, but that's a whole thing later. Um, they, my, my friend, my best friend, Evan had, had called me and let me know that they, we had kind of been talking about it before then, like right around then. And he had, so he had called me to let me know, like, they actually have some here. And so he told me to get down there and came down and, um, he decided that he wasn't going to do it then, which I was kind of like, okay. He was like, but he's like, you know, you, you should do it. You should definitely do it. I'm like, usually I would not, I'm not the daring in that way. Um, but I just felt a peace about it. Um, and decided to go for it and so dnt um it's kind of more mysterious thing to people is uh the way that it's usually consumed is a crystal kind of thing um like a rock kind of thing that melts um and you would put it on like weed and like in a bong you'd like load a bowl of weed and then you put some on top and it would melt into it um, it was like a red, like a red crystal, kind of crystal. I don't know, not crystal, but like sugar more so, yeah. you know? Um, and, uh, you, you take as big of a hit as you can, um, and you hold it in for as long as you can. And then usually you try to take more and kind of compound it. Um, but it happens really quick and it's similar to Salvi in that way. That it's just like a short trip and it just like is zero to a hundred really fast. And so you want to do as much as you can as while you can kind of thing. Um, and so we're in this little smoke room and it's like a, it's pretty much just this pool room, but it's just like a couch and like two chairs. And that's all the room there is. And there's like seven of us in there and I'm in the center. They're all just like around watching and I, uh, oh, they asked me if there's a song, Explosions in the Sky song that they, that I wanted to, to have on. Um, I think it was Remember Me as a Time of Day. I think so. It's a really good one. Beautiful song. Um, 
couldn't hear it so it didn't matter anyways but the thought that counts so i take it and take a pretty good hit and um hold it in and it's it's kind of freaky it's like if you're in a car in like a uh a, a, like a drag car and they just pinned it and you know you're like going from zero to whatever and it's 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 exhilarating and like frightening um or like worrying i guess there's some courage that's needed in it um to to step forward and to continue in it in a weird way um and so yeah so at first closed my eyes and saw a lot of weird stuff and in a weird way like stuff is like there but then it just like all of a sudden something else is there. It's a very weird thing in that, in that regard. Um, strange, all imagery is very strange, fractally. Um, and so it started to get more and more intense. And as that happened, the like body high of it would, would build and build and build to like your whole body and kind of up. And then this ringing in the ears, which is usually like the worst, like whenever you get, whenever something happens that it's like annoying or like uh, tinnitus or whatever. Um, it's, it's that same sound, but it sounds good. Like it's weird, like it's pleasurable and it just gets louder and louder and louder and louder and louder and louder until you can't bear it and can't like resist it. It's weird um, in that way. And so as that occurred, um, that's usually when people will like go through these, I don't know, like portals or these, not portals, that makes it sound more than it is. Like these layers, like, you know, there's all this stack layers and you're like going through them um and people have different opinions about all of this stuff but as that occurred and as it's you know you're getting up to what's called blasting off is usually what people will call it um is where that then occurs that you have this out of body experience or this whatever that you hear people talking about with DMT besides just the the weird stuff the impactful stuff is what happens after blasting off usually um machine elves and all of that kind of stuff is on that side of things usually. But for me, um, as it built and it built and it built and it built, all of a sudden it just got totally white. And then there was like a, a cross, but it was more like what, it, what my, I was thinking about at the time was that it was like a dentist light. You know how they have those dentist lights that they yeah. put on and it kind of has the metal thing. It was like that. It was all I could see though. And it just got brighter and brighter and brighter until it was just, I couldn't look anymore. And it got louder and louder and more powerful and more powerful. Um, and where I would have normally, or where, you know, usually you would have blasted off and gone through some crazy thing. All of a sudden I was sitting on a beach. Very weird. Mm -hmm. Sitting on a beach, looking out at the ocean and um was there for i mean it was only a couple minutes like this whole thing was at tops 10 minutes um but it i was there for i don't know how long a really long time and it was the first breath of of fresh air or of like relaxedness um being okay um yeah, since Kiana had died. Um, and so this was three weeks after that or something like that. I was just in this stressed out, you know, a little bit suicidal, um, very dark over it place for a long time or for, for weeks. And it was just this like, finally, this burden taken off of me. And I just sat there and just soaked it in for what felt like days and days. And then 
all of a sudden it kind of just like faded out and opened my eyes and um, was back in the room with all of the guys. They're all looking at me smiling. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> um, and everything at that point, everything was still like geometrical. Like anything that has texture or anything like that was had a weird patternness to it. Um, and so that was, there was no real like mystical experience in it, except for then afterward. So after the drug, you know, with the drug, there was no mystical, really like impactful mystical experience. It was just this thing that helped me hugely. But then as I walked out of the, the smoke room and was out back, um, as soon as I walked out, I just looked straight up to the, the stars and there's this constellation that kind of looks like um, an arrow in certain ways. It's, it's Orion. It's actually Orion's belt um, yep. on one half of it. So yeah, you know, um, and that since then has been Kiana's constellation for me. Mm -hmm. um, but as soon as I looked up to that, um, I just heard her voice and it's just like, like it's okay or or um like it's gonna work out like don't don't worry um i'm okay and it was i was i was at that like that was like fully past the drug um and that was a very strange experience like vividly her voice and and loudly in my head saying it um instantly without provocation or whatever so that was a that was the first time that i'd done it um and um so the second mystical part of that outside of the drug kind of was two years later in hawaii during my testimony, when as my testimony is taking place, as my return to the faith is taking place, I'm in Hawaii, sitting on the beach, just had just um, listened to some why I was at a YWAM base. Um, I was homeless in Hawaii and we did some farming program that Sherry actually does. Um, didn't work out at all. It's a whole thing. Ended up at this one beach. And as I was thinking about, it was weird that all of this stuff had been happening and clearly God had been revealing stuff or like making himself known to me in this time. And I was looking out at the beach, just kind of soaking it all in and just relaxing and just kind of being there. And I realized that this was what I saw when I was in that smoke room. And the first time that I did DNT, like literally mm. was it. Like, I'm not like, not like, oh, yeah, it's two beaches and well, like, no, like, like saw the future in a really weird way. And not just saw the future, saw my return to the faith. Um, the, the timing of that, it was very strange. And it's something that I'd still think about. Obviously have a, you know, materialist or whatever on the shoulder as well. That's like, you're such an idiot. Like you're just misremembering or, you know, whatever. But, um, it was very clear in that moment. Like it was like reminded, like it wasn't something I was thinking about at all, but it was just like, Hey, does this look familiar kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that was a, it was an interesting thing of the actual experience just providing some like relief um or like maybe catharsis or something like that but then the actual mystical experience happening both of them happening outside of the actual drug um which was very strange i was thinking about that last night um so yeah that was the first time i've done it a handful of times i've not I've not since Hawaii actually though um so it's been 
seven years, something like that. Um, but the second time I did it, this is a weird one as well. Um, at my friend's house, up in his room, and it's the four of us, the, 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 my best friend, Evan, was there as well. And this was, he was now wanting to, or I think he had done it a different time. So he was wanting to do it again. But he, when I did it the first time, I didn't do as much as other people do, I guess. And so he wanted to make sure that I really blasted off. Or I guess in just recalling the story, he was like, no, that's not blasting off. Like you need to do more. So like, you know, so you can get the real trip. So I was like, all right, whatever, for sure. Like, I guess I'll, yeah. And so it's me, him, another friend, and then the friend whose room it is, whose house it is. And he's not down. I mean, he's like not, he's okay with it, but he's, he's not doing it himself. Um, so it's just me, Evan, and then our other friend, Kevin. Um, and while we're doing it, the other friend that lives there is literally playing. It's like the stupidest thing. I don't know how I didn't think of it, but he's playing like call of duty or like some kind war game loud. Like it's like speakers on and we're all doing psychedelics. Like, uh, it's just (laughs) dumb, dumb. But it was it was only a facet of this. So um, so I go first. And as I'm doing it, I I didn't want to take the whole thing. I didn't want to do all of it. And so I once again, just kind of or not once again, but just did it kind of light and passed it off and went off to, you know, put my head, my beanie down or whatever, put my hat down to block out the light and just close my eyes and stuff and started to, you know, it started to to go off but um quickly i realized like oh i didn't take enough like this was i was this was less than the first time i did it um and so i opened my eyes because you're still kind of there until you're like really gone you're still you in a weird way you can still open your eyes and whatnot and so i'd like open my eyes and evan's in the corner just like like he's doing his, he's having a whole thing. Um, our buddy Kevin is just kind of, he's just has his eyes closed and just kind of chilling. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to take, take another hit. So at this point, I, a thing about DMT is that um, your intention, the telos is important. It, it actually does matter in a weird way. Um, in a like actual spiritual way, I would say, um, in the way that the telos does matter in all things. Um, and so at that point it became a, a reaching and a trying to get a high in a lot of ways, you know, trying to, to get it more intense or, you know, it was not a pure intention at all. And so grab the pipe and roast the rest of it. Um, and again, see Cam's just like gaming down on some war games, probably like Battlefield or something. And um, so I so I take more and then go lay down on his bed. And pretty quickly, as it gets intense, um, it it starts. I start seeing like in the same way as before, as, as I was saying, it was like stuff's very weird. And it's like a daydream in a way that you're seeing stuff. Then all of a sudden it's something else. And all of a sudden it's gone. And then it's, it's weird in that way. I started seeing this disgusting, violent, gross, sexual uh just the worst of the worst kind stuff um this just amalgamation of all of it occurring and it's like usually with that kind of stuff you like open your eyes like if you ever have like a i don't know if other people don't have messed up brains or whatever but um you know you're thinking about something you see something in your your mind's eye that you don't want to see anymore you like open your eyes like oh oh 
you know, that kind of thing. Well, as soon as I had done that, I was just like, oh, I'm not, like, don't want to go there. I'm not trying to, you know, have a bad trip or whatever. It, um, a, a, a strange thing about DMT is that whether it be, you know, some spirits, angels, demons, whatever, or the spirit or what there is, or it just you, a, a deeper part of you or something like that. There is a dialogue that occurs a lot of times and the people that I think people commonly talk about that. Um, but it's an interesting and it's, and most people talk about it in a way that it's like a teacher. It's not, that's why it's different than other things that if like, I was just like shroomed out and started talking to some spiritual being or something started talking to me, reached out to me, it would be much more just like uh, amidst the good time or trying to control me or, you know, I could imagine it being more like that to where any type of communication um, or dialogue as a better, I think a better way of saying it amidst a deem trip is um, informative and revealing or, or honest or like, like you're trying to bullshit yourself. And it's like, no, like, this is what you're actually doing. Um, and so in that moment, um, whatever was the dialogue was just like, you know, this is going to end. Like, it's not like shrooms or like, whatever, that this is going to be eight hours, maybe forever. Like, this is going to be over in 10 minutes, about, you know, maybe five minutes, maybe 15. Like, it's going to be done. And so um, what are you afraid of? Like, what are you in this? What are you actually afraid of? And for me, it was not, it was just experiencing it. It was seeing it. It was, it was a, and so I, I was like, fine. Okay. I'll, I'll watch this or I'll subject myself to this, I guess. Um, so close my eyes and laid back down and just like a, I don't, I don't know, like a, a guy who's trying to pass in the ball in basketball, he's trying to inbound the ball and the other guy's in his face trying to do all this stuff. And he's just, you know, taking it, doesn't, doesn't worry about it. Or the opposite if the guy like fakes, he's going to hit him in the face with the ball and like Michael Jordan just doesn't even flinch kind of thing. Yeah. It's kind of like that to where it wasn't like, definitely was not like a letting in but it was just like fearlessly facing down before that day and this is like i'm 18 years old 19 years old at that point to that point i was and i will admit this i was afraid of the dark like go outside i'd beeline it as quick as i could to whatever i needed to do take out the trash whatever like whether that be because I've had some some weird mystical or or dark experiences throughout my life um, growing up as well. And just in kind of a I guess I'm kind of a scaredy cat in certain ways. Um, was a very real thing, though. Fear of the dark was a very and just fear was a very big thing in my life. From that point. No longer. The, the as a really weird byproduct of it was just like no longer did I dwell on uh, spiritual beings or or you know that kind of stuff like the darkness. Um, it was no longer this controlling fear of the darkness and of the things that live in the dark kind of thing. If you know what I mean. Um, very strange. Um, did not go into it expecting that, did not, you know what I mean? That was not what I was there for, um, but was very much the case that like that point forward, it was just never, like I dealt with it. You know, I'd, I'd seen nothing, that's, I'd, I've seen worse kind of thing, you know? Um, and with what I saw, uh, I, I had no besides the words that I used before, I had no way of like really describing it until um, 
my roommate now, but I wasn't living here then, showed me, um, I don't recommend the show necessarily to anyone, but uh, Devil Man Cry Baby. It's an anime, um, kind of a weird one on like demonology and Solomon's, like the, the lesser key of Solomon and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, really weird show in that way. But the imagery is like, it freaked me out when I watched the show. Like it was like alarming because it was like, I've never seen anything that was so close to what I saw. Um, So it was that that, that kind of imagery. It was just like off putting to the max and just dark. And so that was the second time. Um, The third time I, or third or fourth was out, um, out in the, out in the mountains um i had finally done i had like done enough to blast off i don't remember this is the one that i don't remember anything from um which they talk about like as if you reach a certain extent it's like called like the level of amnesia it's what people talk about with this sort of things but i don't know um the only time that i've ever like really blast off was that time in the back of that truck and as i was done the only thing I really remember about it was then um, kind of coming to and then climbing out of the truck and seeing the, my, my friends sitting by the fire, looking at this mountain range that the moon was just beginning to rise over the top full moon behind it was just beginning to rise over it. And so we sat down and I decided to, to partake again, but just a little bit. As the moon rose over the mountains, one of the most beautiful experiences, um, all of the sky was red, yellow, and green, like this kind colors uh, in, in distinct as well. Um, and that's the only thing that I remember about that was not the whatever intense experience, um, but was this after kind of just looking in or just looking off and, and enjoying this moment. Um, then the one after that, um, and we're almost done with this, by the way, the one after that um, was interesting. It was with my friend, Evan, again. Um, upon doing it very quickly, it, um, it freaked me out. Like, and that's what I've been saying. Like, I'm not a guy that does, you know, and me being kind of cowardly or whatever, like, I don't like going super fast or, you know, I'm not an adrenaline junkie at all. That's not my game. And so this is, it's kind of like that in a way of like zero to a hundred is it's this like adrenaline thing that when I am faced with it, I'm usually like, Oh, pump the brakes. You know, that's like my reaction to those kind of things is like, Let's, let's get in control. Um, and so I had done enough to, to really, you know, go for it. But as soon as that rose up, as soon as it really started to, to accelerate, I, um, I uh, put the brakes on it. Like I had control over it to not make it take over. And And then was like, oh, that's, and like instantly realized what I'd done and wanted to not to change that. And the whatever dialogue was like, nope, like you, that's, that's not how this works. Um, You have to give in to, not to, like you cannot approach this with fear. You cannot uh, have one foot in the water and one foot on the shore. like if you're going to learn this lesson, then you need to actually learn it. Um, but for now, like, nope, this is obviously isn't for you. So, you know, you can just hang out here for a little bit, but you're, you're done um, in a weird way. And um, yeah, came out of it and was nothing. And then the last time was in Hawaii, actually, um, at this farm that I'm working on. And so to tie in a little bit of the testimony, I went to Hawaii to chase down the girl that got away, basically. 
um, but to also have a, an adventure and to uh, try out this worldwide organic opportunities for farmers, woofing, or something like that, um, uh, which you work on a farm and they pay your room and board, basically. They, they allow you to survive. And so you can travel around and be able to see the world by doing this. It's kind of a cool program, except you either, you either have the best experience or have a really good farmer that you're working for, or you have a really bad farmer and it's like chattel slavery, basically, mm. <laughs> um, yeah. or some kind of, you know, indentured servitude. Um, and that was more my experience. Um, so I, I get to the airport, fly into Hawaii. And when the guy finally picks me up, he tells me, like, the first thing he says is, hey, man, uh, so just so you know, um, my name's Thane, but uh, my middle name's Lucifer. Um, <laughs> it's nice to meet you. Um, and just so you know, Waipio Valley, where we live, is in Hawaiian history, is the gateway to the underworld. So I'm Lucifer. Welcome to Hades. And uh, <laughs> let's let's get it cracking. Wow. Something like that. I was just like, huh. And at that point, this point, I'm not, you know, it's obviously the beginning of my testimony. So I'm not, I'm away from the faith at this mm -hmm. point. So I don't, you know, I'm like, just kind of laugh at it. Um, yeah, Peugeot could have fun with that one, like patterns I've, manifesting or something. <laughs> I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell you this testimony sometime, not, not tonight, but mm -hmm. another time I'll tell you my testimony because uh, I wanted to tell Patrick on my testimony for that reason as well. It's a, it's very strange in that way. But um, so I get to, here's another added part of it. Uh, we get finally get to the farm and I meet the, there's one other woofer that's there. And we're in the back of YPO Valley as well. Like you have to cross a river, you have to drive up a river and then you have to cross a river, like a bigger river. Um, and then you have to climb up like 70 steps to get to the plateau even. And then the, the woofer's cabin is like further in the jungle. There's no power, no, except for like some solar, no water, no any amenities um, in the jungle kind. And uh, so I meet the other woofer whose name is Michael. And so they're instantly like, Oh, we got, we got Lucifer. We got Michael. So like, all right, you're going to be Gabriel. I guess you're Gabriel. I'm like, I, okay, sure. Like, <laughs> um, but Michael and another weird thing is Michael was into, uh, and had been like talking to me and like had these books of a different couple of different books. But the one I remember was like the, something about the eye of Ra. Um, it was like this Egyptian, kind uh uh religious structure that you know new age kind or not new age but um i guess a new age flair on it that he was going for he was from like washington so small kind hippie land as well <laughs> but he had which was crazy he had smuggled uh some dmt to hawaii through the airport i'm like bro i don't know if you knew like what you were risking because like you could go to jail forever for that kind of stuff hmm. like there's yeah. some low tolerance of those with with that type of substance but um he ended up yeah successfully doing that and um we didn't have a pipe though and so and our job there was picking kakui nuts off of the jungle floor dumbest worst this is the worst 80 pounds of kukui nuts a day. Mm. And if you didn't make that 80 pound limit or whatever quota, you had to make it up the next day um, or pick it during the night. And if you did it at night, you'd have a headlamp and you would just be covered in bugs. Oh. Like your nose would be full of bugs, your ears, your mouth, your eyes. Like it was just like the worst. So you'd be like, nope, make mm. it up the next day. But this one time um, we finally decided to to just roll a joint and to to put a little bit into throughout the joint a little bit of dmt into it um and so it wasn't enough to like trip really um there's more just like to relax after this long day of stupid work 
And, um, and so we did that a couple of times. And one day, neither of us had got our quota of Kukui nuts. And so we were like, you know what we need to do? We need to pick at night because I'm not trying to do twice as much tomorrow. And he's like, you know what? Before we do that, let's smoke a DNT J. Um, so with with YPO Valley, and especially this part of YPO Valley that that we live on, there are like you'll look around, you'll see the structures still of like the foundations of different houses, like halles and uh, temples as well, like like a lot of different buildings everywhere. And additionally, a weird thing is that this was where that spot, that plateau was where King Kamehameha actually went into hiding and was like um, trained in uh, military strategy and was like mm. came up to, into a man before then going from there out into um, the, the first battle of the YPO Bay and then going to unify all of Hawaii as one kingdom from that point. Interesting backstory. But yeah, so we smoked this this laced joint basically and and go out into this mystical valley with with yeah um Hawaii is already mystical enough but so pretty quickly there's like noises and weird stuff going on that's kind of like peripheral and um just like no i don't know like no that was nothing it was nothing you hear something like way further off like ah! like some scream or something like that just like ah, it's white peel valley dude this place but then i started seeing shadows behind trees like darting behind trees and like moving around and and started to look around and realize that we're deep in this like neighborhood basically there's multiple foundations around and um so i started to get freaked out because i'm like we just smoked this dmt and i'm seeing stuff like i don't know what's going on i'm not like high at that point like i'm totally sober now it's been an hour or so maybe somewhere around that all of a sudden michael comes running up and he's just like dude uh we need to get out of here like this is not like I'm seeing stuff. I'm like, you do too. Like, yeah. It's like, okay, we're, we're done. We're done for the night. We're, we're going back. And so we left. And so that was another thing. Um, instilling this, like this gateway kind of thing, or this, like this connection, um, between being, uh, just this physical reality and everything else being invisible to us. And then like actually seeing some stuff that's going on um is my opinion at least that it was definitely a uh, not enough to go on some trip or anything but enough to reveal a little bit more of what's happening um and that was the last time i did it but the next two days later um a guy who lived somewhere around the jungle had had come smokes meth and stuff but he had happened to have a brand new meth pipe and was like oh you guys can because we let him i think we were like rolling up another joint or something like that and he's like oh you guys could smoke it out of this and we're like yeah probably not man like probably not gonna take that risk that this is actually a, a clean pipe um but then thane or lucifer or whatever comes up to the cabin <sighs> And um, he, a uh, uh, random note, he knew how to take toads, those certain toads, and knew how to massage them correctly to get them to expel their, their toxin, but in a way that it doesn't have the toxin. And that's like another DMT as well, I guess. Hmm. Um, but if you don't do it right, it's like the craziest, worst, you know, because um, it's this the toads put it out to make their prey go crazy. Um, but there's a way that you can do it, that it's like a good trip, I guess. Hmm. So he said he lied a lot, but he 
was believable as well. well. His name is Lucifer. I mean, yeah. well, <laughs> I, it's that's a weird thing. How much he was that? Like, mm. it's very strange. And this is this story as well. So he decides, like, ah, oh, fine. It's a it's a stormy day. It's why we weren't out, we weren't out picking because it was raining and in the jungle. Like raining is like raining, raining. So we can't go out. And so it's completely overcast. The the whole valley is like full. You can't even see that far. And so he comes out to the the cabin and um, he's sitting with us and sees that, sees the the DMT. And he's like, you know what? Screw it. I haven't done this in however many years, but we're doing it. Mm -hmm. So he takes that meth bub and puts them in there and smokes it. The moment that he lights it, that he starts inhaling the actual smoke, the clouds break just enough for a single ray of light to come shining in nowhere else it stays overcast everywhere this single ray of light comes shining in through the window and just hits him like just goes onto him as he and then he has this trip and as he stops as soon as it happens he stops and he says i told you guys i'm the angel of light and then he's i was like what what is happening like this is weird and so yeah he had his own little trip but that was like a the timing of those types of things is is what gets me wow um, that's just yeah. crazy <laughs> so that yeah and then a couple days after that was when i finally had enough and my my story uh continued um so yeah, that is the the for the most part. I'm probably missing some some other experiences, um, but those are the most prominent array of different types of psychedelic experiences that can be had and that I've had um, that have more and less, but you know, to a different to to a substantial extent affected my journey and who I am and the way that I see things um, and my faith as well. Um, even still today, you know, um, the perspective that I got from psychedelics was, um, yeah, definitely changed me and, or refined me, I guess, and helped me to ditch some, you know, to, uh, Peterson or Verveke's point, you know, helped me to ditch some modernity um, in certain ways. Uh, but at the same time, like going back to Paradiso, the the rave, that was the first time I had seen people smoke smoking DMT just to get just to have fun, just to see crazy stuff. Um, and it was like a weird because before it was very sacred. Like it was like I'm a I'm a an agnostic but this is a sacrament kind of thing and these people are just like in this tent trying to see crazy stuff like i had never seen someone you know it's like someone trying to get full off of the eucharist or something <laughs> hmm. um like it was just weird like disconnect of like wait why do you you know so there is also this a this easy ability for it to just be pleasure or just to be cool or a uh, novel or you know an adventure but then there's also a very big tendency or it's just the way that we're wired especially as moderns um for this type of stuff to be utilitarian and an instant um like instead of like basically what pasha was saying of like instead of actually growing righteousness and actually um you know developing uh, habits and and growing and you know all of that going through the process it's like no i could just take this tab and then i'll have this whole thing that you're striving after like you're an idiot i'm just going to do this now um so the whole unearned knowledge is definitely a a thing except i don't it's more the, the unearned experience because i don't know if you get the knowledge if you if you don't put in the the reps 
Um, so I don't know if there is unearned knowledge because I don't think you get the knowledge, I guess. So yeah, that, I, I see the, there is fruit in it. There's fruit in psychedelic experience, um, potentially. Um, and so as a Christian, especially, um, we are called to, like in, in the way that we have um, different things that we must abstain from, um, we are called to be obedient, personally obedient. Um, something that may be good or maybe, you know what I mean, is not good for me because I can't partake in it in a good way um, or, or in a, you know, I'll just go crazy with it or I'll, you know, have the wrong telos or um, it, it brings about more fleshliness or like whatever. There's all this stuff that um, we like to have hard and fast rules that everyone has to follow, but a lot of stuff doesn't work that way. And it's, it's an individual game. Um, and so I am open to, yeah, like I'm open to Hashem using these things. Um, but I don't know if like, it's kind of the, these experiences being used were despite me, it was like, well, you know, you, I would much rather you go about it in this way, but um, I'm going to meet you where you're at, Caleb. And here's this experience that, you know, can potentially bring you back closer to me eventually through process in time, um, in the long game. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky subject that I think is more nuanced than people let on. But then at the same time, there's like, it's, it's also like, well, there's better ways. Like it, it reminds me of with Paul, when you have the, the law and then you have the spirit. Um, yep. And he's like, it's, it's not that this is bad. It's just like you, you have a deeper available to you. You have available to you a deeper connection with God himself. Like, why are you trying to go to this thing when you can go to this? Um, and I think that's a lot of what the whole uh, refraining from divinization and everything that in, that entails is like, it's, it's not, yeah, it's, it's like, instead, go through relationship. Um, come to me for, you know, what, what James says, like, the, he, he, ask him, ask the father. He's the giver of all good gifts. Um, and he, yeah. And, but instead we, we try to take it into our own hands and make it happen for ourselves, I guess. Um, yeah. So that's a lot of my experiences. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's incredible to hear. Um, so like, uh, where are you now in terms of, like, are you attending a church and like what tradition is it in? And yeah. So, um, the same, it's a cool kind of cool thing of this. It's the same church, um, Rogue Valley fellowship, hmm. um, that I grew up in. It's about as old as me. It's a little bit older than me when it finally started. Um, and about 10 years ago, um, yeah, about 10 years ago, um, the torch was passed from pastor to pastor, um, and just kind of a new, a new phase of, of our church, um, a new chapter. And, um, the, the pastor who took the, the, the reins or whatever, um, was actually my youth pastor growing up for a time. Um, but he has taken, it's in a different direction, not in a different direction, a progressed, oh, I almost said progressive direction, <laughs> a progressed direction um, and a, a more mature direction. Um, we 
lost our building or or luckily were able to get out from under this building that had accrued a bunch of debt and all these facilities that like were like dreams in the future but it just like never worked out and then it got passed off onto him and it was kind of this thing but um so we've been kind of homeless and um yeah we've basically we were like non-denominational um calvary chapel but not calvary chapel was was what we were before it was very that style but now we what what the pastor's joke is um some of them is uh kind of this place of like reforthodoxy like reformed orthodoxy um because we are like the pastor kenner he teaches at uh pacific bible college pacific bible college is kind of linked um, with our church, not linked, but we're, we're close. And it's this whole uh, kingdom think is the, the um, kind of the motto of PBC. Um, and so it's this, this shift that, yeah, the shift into just like seeking first the kingdom and, and that being the model instead of this American stuff um one way or another and also getting into you know much more of the church fathers and um and becoming a holistic church as far as to be to be relevant with the the um what's going on on the bridge as of late um it's definite we are reformed and so um there is a credo um not emphasis, but, and I think that's where we differ is like, it's just foundational. Um, like in that kingdom think it's, it's, this is where, and I think you are akin as well of just like, this is the solo scripture is not solo scripture. It's not just this, it's not the be all end all. Um, but it is the, the most established or deepest rooted revelation that we can turn to um, and can build upon. Um, And so there is this this credo foundation, but we're also moving into um, and have been moving into, you know, definitely being more liturgical and being more, um, you know, getting all the the religio kind going a lot more. Um, Yeah, It's it's been a very interesting experience in that way. Um, and it's all three of the main pastors are, they're more, they're in their like thirties, early forties. Um, and yeah, it's an interesting move that they've not been in this corner of the internet, but like have been in a similar process as well. Um, and have, I think we all kind of were, didn't know there was other stuff out there didn't know there was other, not that there was other stuff out there, but like what we were told was not the sole option or the sole version of it. Um, there's more, it's not that clean cut. It's a little messier than that. You know, there's a little more grappling to do. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I love my church. Um, whenever I, you know, different people are turning to orthodoxy, I'm like, man, I wish you just come out to, to Medford and you know, just check out our church. I, you probably stay, <laughs> probably stay in the the reformed side of things. Um, we're also getting there as well, but yeah, it's um, it's a, a very interesting thing to be a part of, and I can be romantic or like um, have delusions of grandeur, and. and um, So, you know, maybe that's some of it, but I definitely see, I think they're being used in a, in a, in a mighty way or, or more so will be used in a mighty way. Um, As far as, yeah, as far as, you know, what PVK talks about with like ending the protest, um, I think that RVF is a model of 
what ending the protest looks like mm -hmm. if it is not um not acquiescing but like returning to either catholic or eastern orthodox um you know like that doesn't ending the protest does not need to be that necessarily um we're still moving forward we're still nomadic you know um we, we can't go back we, we we can only go forward and um yeah and we're growing and um yeah it's interesting we'll see yeah have you had any um any like would you say spiritual experiences in church so in um well in church that's why i kind of put quotes in that that message um because it was m more so in in life early like in early life it was more just like things that would happen in life not necessarily in the church um because yeah like i was a mystical kid growing up mm. you know i was definitely in that way um and had some kind experiences but so i would say like in church specifically i would more link to with ywam because that was what i ended up doing in hawaii um which ywam's a, a trip in itself <laughs> <laughs> um uh with that a so one that was um deeply impacting um and what i would call actually a, a theophany um was in so there's this this okay so there's the the ywam ships is what i was where i was at which is downtown kona and then up the hill there's the university of the nations which is like a big big campus ywam school and they have a ministry room there that's like always open and they have ministry nights um and so i mentioned the point of going to hawaii was to to get the girl that got away um, and try to try to get her back and so amidst that she actually was at this ywam base and played a part in my testimony um but then she had a boyfriend at the time and so all this stuff happened yeah. i moved to hawaii or i moved to to maui i had some friends on maui so i left the base after after returning to the faith i couldn't be around her and stuff so i moved to maui for like two months and then finally it was shown to me that i was jonah um and it was pretty forcefully pretty forcefully brought back to big island um has some scars to to show for that but um so i struggled with being around this girl and being at the same you know there's like 70 people living in close community and like seeing her and him and stuff like it was just not what i wanted or that i could handle but ended up um ended up going to what ministry night and um during the worship um as you know more charismatic kind worship can be uh ended up we ended up repeating the same line for like, I don't know how long, like five minutes maybe. And Bryce was up there just like, your love is enough. Your love is enough. Your love is enough. Mm -hmm. Over and 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 over. Um, which was annoying to me. Um, mm -hmm. But was so, oh, okay. So at a certain point, I'm finally like in my head, like, we get it like move <laughs> on dude you know that kind of thing yeah as soon as i expressed that instantly god said um is my love enough mm. like right now you're destroyed you're broken because this girl doesn't love you the way that you love her um so you're you're singing this song like is my love actually enough and and a little less probably a little less like harsh than i presented there but that's still like putting the onus on me and instantly i was dropped to the floor and was just crying um 
confessed or, or repented um, and was just this, this moment of conversation. Um, and in that, um, some, some words were passed. Like one was like, um, so I'll, I'll share with you because we're, we're already, this is such a weird conversation anyways. Um, I'd seen after I had, after that kind of had calmed down, it was kind of this place of like, okay, well, I got you. Like I, I, I have you on the line, so I might as well make use of this or whatever. Um, and it was like, what else do you have to tell me? Um, what do you, what do you have to show me? Um, help me basically. And, um, one thing that was shown to me was like a, like a, a Cadillac that was like glossed, like metallic purple paint for the most part. And then all of the like bumpers everywhere, that everywhere there'd be Chrome, it was like gold. So it was just this like gaudy over the top pimped out Cadillac just to the max, just bells and whistles, wings on top of wings, as far as, you know, just too much. And then all of a sudden it started, there was like a circle and that was like half split halfway and that was on top. And then it started to spin and turn around. And as it did, this other Cadillac was revealed symmetrical to it upside down. Um, that was like a beautiful burnt orange, just like a nice classic color. Um, the wheels, everything was just like restored stock. Um, the, the classic look of it was just like brand new looking and a, just exquisite, but not over the top at all. And, and as it was turning, he told me to, to turn it upside down you're going to turn it upside down or you are to turn it upside down kind of thing, whatever that means um, or whatever that applies to. Um, but that was, it was very vivid. I can still see it today. Um, and then some other stuff added to that as well, or after that. Um, but that was the, that is the most explicit um, mystical spiritual experience I've ever had um yeah wow that's i mean that's like that's incredible i mean i'm just trying to sort of compare notes for my own experience because i've had um mostly pretty much in worship contests in other contexts like you know being in nature somehow and some really yeah. profound way that's happened too but that's just yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's a lot of res. I mean, there's a lot of resonance, like just on the nature point in terms of like climbing, like I've like actually climbing a mountain, you know, which I've, you know, I've done that a number of times and, you know, the meeting place of heaven and earth. And that's something I've been thinking about more recently, but um, in terms of like the worship context, like I've had a lot of, you know, I've, I've had experiences like, like similar to that, where it's been, um, you know, worshiping and, and very charismatic and the re repetition, especially, I think is, is somehow important in figures in that. Um, but just being sort of whatever you would call it, you know, slain in the spirit or sort of having the spirit come over you and then God just sort of drops something in your mind. And it's just like a, if, if I were to use a fancy verbaki words, you know, like a reciprocal opening or something, <laughs> I think that would be the right term. Totally. Yeah. Uh, definitely <laughs> um so it's <laughs> it, it it's just really interesting because that sounds like a lot what of what i've experienced and then because i'm trying to at the same time see what degree of like mutual intelligibility there is between um uh, those those sort of experiences and um and like the psychedelic experiences if there's any um because it like it's very clear that God spoke to you through that you know that time on, on DMT when you were you were there at the beach and that was like a vision yeah. of the future which is um like that sort of thing is it's it's almost like a staple of 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 pretty hardcore charismatic sort of things not like the DMT trip but you know the the sort of yeah totally. the sort of vision and you might get an idea of 
what's happening in the spiritual realm or something, even in, in the future or, or whatever. Um, so, uh, like, I guess maybe my question is if, if you're comparing those, what do you see as like the similarities and, and the differences? Like, would you say even that, you know, maybe one experience is more true than the other, however imprecise of a word true is, you know? Word. Um, yeah, I would, I'd say, um, I don't know what to, to call the more like what I was just talking about, the like legitimate uh, spiritual experiences. Um, the, as I've been telling these stories tonight, it's, it's kind of felt like, um, like the psychedelics were more of like a, like a software update or like a, you know what I mean? Is more subtle changes or subtle. Yeah. Or subconscious or, you know, it was more, it wasn't as like, definitely wasn't as clear and it wasn't as um, explicitly um both explicit explicitly a, a, a spiritual experience or um beyond perhaps a, a chemical thing occurring um but then also the the spiritual experiences were um the the most impactful and um which was interesting um that they uh were definitely the yeah after after a psychedelic experience it would be like what like what was that about or you know trying to discern you know get a a, a debrief of what occurred um to where spiritual experiences i guess are more just like being and like relationship be like a software update to to you know we need to update zoom and that's the the psychedelic kind and then actually speaking to you on zoom is like an actual spiritual experience i guess um so it's almost like the the, the psychedelic experience is maybe less personal than yeah yeah because yeah, i don't i don't want to say that it wasn't impactful because like it definitely played a huge role in my journey um and it saved my life hmm. as far as as far as that first one goes um i was not in a good way and yeah was definitely volatile um and was tired of it and so that i don't take that lightly um and then just with even like the more subtle of of like with mushrooms and stuff um the it it established a lot um of groundwork stuff or or of yeah building blocks i guess um as far as in 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 towards like um mystical things more um like in you know I guess what what people may imagine as what will be the re-enchantment um, kind of thing. Um, so it was fruitful in that way, but it was definitely a more, yeah, impersonal, uh, arenic, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, kind so of... it's, it's almost like it's first Corinthians where it's like, you know, for now I see through a glass darkly and I know in part, but you know, you know, then I will know face to face and, you know, see clearly. So it might even be that the psychedelics are sort of seen through the glass darkly. Like there's still something there, Word. but then maybe, you know, yeah, we see, revelation. yeah, I would say we see all of reality um, to Paul's point. We see all of reality through a lens yeah, dimly um, already. This, this all is already a riddle to us. Um, but 
yeah, that is like an especially so. Like it's even more um, uh, perceivably dim. And yeah, I would definitely, yeah, I, I, I like that. Um, do you think, oh, I lost my train of thought here, but, um, like, is there, uh, I guess sort of reflecting on both of those types of experiences, do you think, um, do you think that because I'm, I'm sort of thinking of the, the sort of the four horsemen convo when, um, you know, Baron Peugeot, Peterson and um, Vervecki all got together. Um, and it was, it's what's, what's interesting to me is listening to that. And, um, you know, Baron and Peugeot were sp specifically like, you have this mystical experience and then let it go. You know, Baron was citing some saint or somebody who basically said, you have to, you know, you have it. And then you sort of like let go of it. Um, so what's what's interesting to me about that is that it seems like the mystical experiences for them were not foundational to their faith. Uh, like they were maybe an important part, but they weren't like the the bedrock yeah. other thing. And I think I think I I agree with that on a on a fundamental level. Um, at the same time, like uh, I can't even imagine what my faith would look like it would be completely different if at all without having those you know the specifically charismatic spiritual experiences totally um and so like i wonder um just just for you having had both of those do you think that uh do you do you think they're you know do you think they're totally accurate in, in sort of claiming that like are the maybe the experiences are more fundamental than we than, than some people think, because it seems like they were just so deep and, and rooted and like, you know, you had a vision of the future and you had all of this stuff yeah. happening that was such a paradigm shift. So, um, let's put this together. Like, um, one thing is with a psychedelic experience um, compared to, but even still with a mystical experience, um there is a lot more uh ability to be deceived or misled or yes. um there's a lot more requirement for discernment and and i guess responsibility or or something to where like in the nature of a uh you know spiritual experience it's your your uh communing with Hashem, you know, it's, it's a different ball, ball game altogether um, to where there's still like, you still need to discern the spirits and you still need to, you know, um, you could not be communing with Hashem, I guess, as I'm leaving that open as well, but it's way more so there. And so um, if mystical experiences need to be let go of, um, these definitely need to be let go of. Um, and maybe that relates to like the body and that relates to the spirit um, or the mind as far as hierarchy goes. But um, I would say, so with, with letting these things go, um, there's no reason not to as well. I think you can juxtapose holding them as like a reality or um, an important thing that happened in your life and not like this. Um, if something is fate, it's going to happen. You, you know, as far as the, the Shakespearean stuff goes, like even in your trying to make it not happen, you're making it happen. Um, and so there's no need to like cling to uh, this this experience and like no but this promise like um like caleb the spy you know um saw the promised land stood up for it tried to make it happen didn't happen but god still promised him 
no, you will see it and you will be given it. Um, and, and he didn't like spend those 40 years like, Oh, but he said, Oh, oh where are we going to like, no, he was like, no, it's, it's going to happen. Um, and I love the, in, and I have the NASB when it says, um, his promises or the promise or, you know, that kind of thing. It, it's the literally is like, it was spoken of like, like Hashem spoke this. And so his speaking is his promising. Um, and so it's that, like, it's actually living in that reality um, that it's like, no, like if this is going to occur, then it's going to occur. There's nothing that I can will about this. And especially in the psychedelic sense, it should definitely instill some humility of like, I don't know what the F is going on in all of this reality. Like there's so much more, you know, at play than I had thought kind of thing. And so it's like, I am in the hands of a, a patient God and a loving God. Um, so I, I, I definitely agree with them as, as, but that's, it's more so in like a posture of everything. It's not just, you know, meta, uh, mystical experiences or spiritual experiences or psychedelic experiences or whatever. It's like all things we're, we're climbing this mountain with, with the hands up, you know, that he wants to put some stuff in my hand and give it to me for sure. I'm not going to cling on to it. I will retain this posture with all that is given to me or I am supposed to, you know, um, it is best if I do that. I definitely am prone to, to cling on and to, you know, and to want to do it myself as well. So one, one side is definitely wanting to cling on to this thing and, and um, neurotically cling to it. But then the other one is, is wanting to, you know, in Hawaii with the girl that got away. Um, it was, that's, that's a whole story as well. Um, and I eventually, she ended up getting engaged and stuff. And I, and, and God told me like, don't worry about it. Like I will, mm. I will work it in the way that it will work. Um, what I've promised, what I've spoken of, I've promised, you know? And I was like, cool, but I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this happen. Cause I don't really trust you. Yeah. Um, it's odds seem pretty stacked against me. So I think I need to make some moves to like change this stuff. So I'm going to do that. And because of that, in the end, it destroyed a lot. It hurt a lot of people. Um, and it, it tarnished, not tarnished, but it, you know, like even, uh, David and Bathsheba were, um, this, this crafting a rule for life book, uh, I'm going through, get the glare off of it. Um, by Stephen Machia, Machia or whatever. But one thing he says is, um, in talking about David, um, he, he mentions how David and Bathsheba's relationship was, uh, um, what's the word? It was like at first cursed, it was immediately cursed, but then over time was blessed. Um, and it, that is a similar thing of like, it wasn't, it didn't tarnish it, but it, it instill it was not the fullness of it. And it created problems that, um, you know, everyone involved had to then deal with. And, um, yeah. And so that, you may still arrive at that promise if you do cling or if you do usurp control and try to make it happen. But um, I don't know if it'll be the, the same fullness as if you just uh, had a posture of humility and faithfulness and kept walking forward. Um, so I think that's their, their reasoning was a bit more of a response to the psychedelics. I think yeah. it was like, we have to make sure that people aren't like, we're not endorsing taking psychedelics. Yeah, um, right. But I do think they're right. Um, that is a, it's a necessary, unfortunate thing that they had to do as far as being heavy handed in that way um, or unnuanced, I guess. They're just, you know, this is what it is. 
um, but they're they're pretty much still right, even with the nuance. I would say. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point too. That they were, you know, in the moment they're wanting to be very firm against the sort of uh, determinative psychedelic thing. Yeah, because um, if they're not, then it, you know, yeah, it's put on them. Like, oh, Pajot said, I could get <laughs> messed up, dude. Right, totally. And, and you know, Bishop Barron's like. Uh, an archbishop yeah. of somewhere you know he's that got a six of the party line so yeah, yeah. he's um, getting some real trouble yeah yeah but i think so i think i that that does make more sense to me because at first i was like i'm not sure i agree but i think like i i understand what they're saying because even in even in like the the charismatic tradition like um there's periods of intense revival and, and outpourings of the spirit you know, the Toronto blessing, Brownsville, mm. Florida, IHOP, all of these places where God is just moving and doing crazy things. And, and at other times, which, um, I mean, now it seems more like we're in this sort of a time that it seems like it's a lull almost that there's not like, maybe there's stuff in individual places, but it's not as much of a, a, a collective, uh, you know, whatever, a, a, a collective catharsis or something yeah um, so explicit revival right right and um i think the the advantage is i mean that should really be most of the time what the christian life is anyways because you think of of, of paul on the damascus road i mean he has that and then he goes off for 13 14 years and he's just in the middle of the desert um trying to you know figure it figure it out or whatever so um there's something about uh, and I think, you know, charismatics tend to, you know, sometimes they do this well, sometimes not so much about, you know, keeping that sort of sustaining uh, daily cycle of, of faith and of prayer and like absolutely pray for revival and pray for miracles and pray for whatever. But, um, you know, it's sort of like, like the like Azusa Street or IHOP or whatever, that's not the norm, <laughs> historically yeah. speaking. And I would say God is not your experience of God. Um, and so those things can become dangerous quickly in that regard of like something me and Jacob have talked about in the past or have commented on or see eye to eye with um, is that with if I was the enemy as far as strategy goes I'm a very strategic driven person as far as strategy goes if I could get you to uh, to stop actually worshiping the actual creator of the universe um, by manifesting a gold cloud or uh some rubies or feathers or stuff um not to say that that's necessarily so but if i could get you to subtly turn your object of affection to that away from hashem then uh i'm gonna do that if i can in a similar way if i can heal you which will result in, because of the circumstances, the, the context will result in you leaving the faith actually um, and, and becoming more unrighteous instead of less or becoming more righteous. Um, I'm going to do that. I'll heal you like that. No second thought. Whatever, what else you need healed, you know? Um, and so I see, I don't think we grapple with enough the, um, the strategies that like we think i don't it's just a, a kind of an arrogance i guess um or a an ignorance at best um of of just like seeing the enemy as as dumb like no like if there is a principality if that's actually how things are you know which is another conversation taking place on the bridge that you were involved yeah in. um which I thought I wanted to add uh, Mammon. I wanted to talk to Joe about Mammon. Hmm. be interesting. Um, but um, 
yeah. So with that strategy, um, I think it's something that needs to be grappled with and, and maintained. Um, and so like the discernment of spirits um, is, is a big necessary thing. And let me grab some real quick. Grab my nibble. Um, Jacob pointed me to Deuteronomy uh, 13. So Deuteronomy 13 says, um, get this up towards the mic a little bit. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises amongst you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true of which he spoke to you, saying, um, of which he spoke to you, saying, let's follow other gods whom you have not known, and let's serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to him. Um, and it goes on to, to talk about the what to do about the prophet, but um, <laughs> that's a different side um, to where we are, are called to discernment um, in all things. And in, I think a big problem with modernity really just comes down to seeing all positive as good and seeing all negative as bad instead of, you know, there being the ability to have a, a positive curse or a, a negative blessing, um, which my life, you know, definitely points to the reality of, I would say. Um, yeah. So I think that, that we, need to be more vigilant and um holistic um we we can tend to be like this this stuff is sacred and this stuff is secular so that stuff doesn't really matter in reality we you know you shouldn't do the bad stuff but like in reality it's whatever most of it's just neutral like no like it's all it's all the same it's all together um it all has to be reckoned with together in each moment so yeah, my long-winded answer to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think I, I think I agree with that, and I think it seems like, um, it's sort of like the, the the fire and the fireplace analogy that, yeah. um, you know, it's come up several times on the server. Just, um, that I think thirteen, you know. Deuteronomy 13 there is sort of arguing here, here's the fireplace, you know, like let's, let's keep it in there. <laughs> um, yep. Let's not let it blaze out of control. Um, cause I think, cause I think um, like, it seems like psychedelics are sort of a fast track onto, they can be not necessarily, but they can be a fast track onto, you know, let us follow other gods or, 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 you know, idolatry. Um, but I think, you know, we, we also shouldn't be too lax, you know, even if we're not doing something like that, because I think, um, you know, there are sort of spirits and principalities that sort of use, you know, screw tape letter strategies to, to get okay. into our minds and our, and our, and our churches to, um, to bring about that deception, even though if we think we're, you know, even though we think we're like, really following God or we've got the Holy spirit or, or whatever. So like, like it's tough. It's, 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 it's a lot so, tougher than we let on. I think, yeah. or that than we have let on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I, yeah, I think that's part of it too, is, 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 is where it can interface with American culture and then it can become like, Oh, well, this is an easy experience or it's for everyone. Or, you know, um, you know, we're going to come into the service and we're going to expect everybody's going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Everybody's going to come out speaking in tongues, all of this stuff. And um, I think, uh, I think what, what, what can be a source of hubris is that sort of certainty, um, you know, totally. certainty of, of, of 
like in one sense, we should absolutely be certain of, of our faith and of the power of God and of the gospel and, and, and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, certainty in, in controlling events and, you know, you know, this, we we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and we're going to get you to speak in tongues, you know, <laughs> like that's not, it's not too far off. Then there's some stuff like that in YWAM yeah. as well. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and it, there's, it's, it's something that could, it's not too far off from the same way that like a pagan ritual or a, like an ayahuasca ceremony or whatever might do. We're going to, you know, you're going to take this, you're going to do X, Y, Z for X amount of time. And this is going to happen or something. Yeah. Um, not to say that all ritual is necessarily bad, of course, but yeah. um, I think there's a danger in that. So I think that's what you're getting at. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah. In a, in a time where, yeah, we don't think of certain things as rituals, um, especially that's where Peugeot has been so helpful for me um, mm. as a, as a Protestant that, um, as an American as well. Um, it's like, no, you can't get outside of ritual. It's just like, you can't get outside of, you know, symbols or, but especially with ritual, like it's, everything's ritual. And so the name of the game is, is making sure that your ritual is actually, um, seeking after and glorifying and and loving the almighty i would say um and being it's just intentionality you know um that's why i think telos and and desire is is such the like foundation level the root um because if you're not if it's not love you know, if it's not, and I don't, I mean, not just like the act of love, but like, if it's not a, an inflamed love that is causing you to do this stuff, then um, it's just utilitarian or it's, it's a desire for something else. There's, there's some other desire is there. Um, so it's, it's necessary um, for us to be in love and to act out of our love which is also love. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think, cause you know, you were talking about how those psychedelic experiences, I mean, they definitely disavowed you from the atheist materialist, materialist worldview. Um, and, you know, you could even see the telos behind those sort of things. Um, do you think that, there might be because that that you know psychedelic sort of thing seems to be rising in prevalence and more people seem to be doing it you know joe rogan's talking about it all the time whatever right yeah. um do you think that it might be a um you think it could be a source for revival in the sense that um like mm -hmm. it's sort of the sense of, of 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 your story maybe maybe on an individual level or maybe more people start doing it and modernity continues to break down and um, people get to a point where they are, they're seeing the, the spirit of finesse again in the world or they're, um, you know, they're, they're seeing God number one again in the world or whatever. And yeah. that at least pushes them closer to the Christian faith. Um, that's difficult to say. Um, I mean, I think that is occurring. I think um, if it became a an explicit trend, like especially, oh man, modernity just sucks so bad yeah. that like um, any good thing, for instance, um, like empathy. Empathy has gotten a lot of uh, notoriety or or um people know what it means or you know what i mean it's it's grown in that way and it's cultural re relevance and empathy is a really good thing but because of its becoming so culturally dominant it has become romantic romanticized and 
and is is more than what it actually is. And so then people will look at like uh, a Doug Wilson will look at empathy and say, no, actually empathy is bad. Like not only is it not this level of amazing, it's also something you need to be wary of or weary of, um, wary, wary, whichever one. Wary, yeah. um, uh, so it's, it's like that kind of thing that, um, we just twist everything into a trap for fools. And so if, if it doesn't happen organically, if it's a, a, a zeitgeist kind of thing, then I don't, I, I think it will um, just be like um, essential oils. Hmm. Um, or I wouldn't, again, going back to strategy and going back to, you know, um, I think it would be easily turned into an essential oils or a, um, yeah, a, a tool of, of obfuscation or, or, um, you know, deception, um, more so than, but at the same time, like the reality, the beautiful reality is, is the almighty works all things for good. Yes. Like truly. Um, okay. And so, you know, at the same time, there is that that's at play. So yes, um, it could be that that is a strategy of the evil one that, that, you know, this is occurring because he, he wants to deceive in that way. Um, or, you know, principalities powers want to deceive in that way. Um, but despite it, um, Hashem will, you know, flip it to good and it'll actually like in my life, bear fruit, um, and actually bringing me towards him. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's with the, the, the enchantment or the re-enchantment, whatever you want to call it. Um, that seems to be looming. That is definitely not here, but is, um, gearing we're, we're seem to be gearing up towards, um, I, it's going to be a weird time for sure. Um, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to look like and I don't know what will be good and what will be bad. Um, cause it's just a totally different rule set, um, or a different, it's a totally different game, I guess. Um, we, yeah, we, I just, humans are so like, that's the problem is we are involved, you know? And since we are involved, like it's going to be screwed up. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, like if it was, yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm wary of whichever word it is again of, of humans, you know, and, yeah. and our uh, unending ability to, to screw stuff up and then to make it even worse. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So well, that's, that's, that's Babel, you know, just <laughs> totally, you know, building the tower. And I mean, I even think about how, you know, tons or languages can be used like even as a source of division in that instance or something. So even if the, um, the sort of not like necessarily, Oh, this is the, the new Testament tons thing, but I just think of, one way where that deception can come in um, in terms of, you know, if there's confusion or there's dissolution, because, you know, I, I was asking Peugeot a question about this um, in, in that Peugeot Q and A or whatever that he had um, on, on, on the server and uh, um, about what the interaction is between, you know, the fire and the fireplace and the sort of how the, how the, the fireplace, you know, the hierarchical institutional church or whatever, that's sort of the, 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 the solid foundation. And then the charismatic stuff is sort of the, the, um, the stuff on the edges, you know, it's this, it's this sort of renewing cyclical pattern that comes in and it's, which is really, I mean, it's so interesting to me because you, 
if you're talking about renewing cyclical patterns, like you can see this throughout church history about these sort of revivals or outpourings of the spirit and they, you know, they, they wax and they wane and they, um, so they, they totally fit the pattern. Um, and I guess, I don't think Pichot totally uh, was on the same frame of mind in my question, but um, that's sort of the, one of the things that I think about that, um, you know, the, the you know, the deception can be longer lasting and maybe more damaging if it gets into the hierarchy, if it gets mm -hmm. into the solid center of things, which is maybe that's what the Reformation was doing. It was recognizing something like that to some extent, mm -hmm. um, not to, you know, totally bash on Catholicism, but just at least to some extent it was there. And then maybe on the other hand, the, the, uh, the, the charismatic stuff is sort of the ways that lap in every few decades or whatever and, and, and start this process of renewal. But at the same time, um, you know, maybe in that case, the deception comes in and it can come in a lot quicker and maybe turn people in a lot quicker way, but maybe it's not so, so um, it, maybe it's not so long lasting and impactful. So I, I guess I, I wonder as people continue to go into psychedelics or whatever um uh you know sort of the 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 time span or the which one of those it's going to be more oriented towards so i don't know if i was going anywhere in particular with that but just sort of <laughs> the stream of consciousness that i was thinking oh I, yeah and i think when I th what I thought of while you were saying that, or from what you said, is I think the what will decide as far as like a um, you know this being becoming more more people are doing this stuff, and so this is whether it's good or bad, it's it's occurring. Um, I think, and if and the, the question of is this going to be used to bring people back to the faith. Um, I think our job is to establish the context around that, since that is already going to be occurring. Um, the, the what's afoot is, is building the structure around that so that coming out of that experience, it's, it's, um, it's digestible because of that. Like, and that's a that's a beautiful thing of the Christian faith is things are actually are digestible. Yeah. So where without it's like, who freaking knows yeah. what that was? Mm -hmm. Or you know what I mean? Um, and so yeah, maybe to differ from the past, um, to where before the church was very just like against it and um you know turn away yeah. from it and all of that kind that when the church does that you're, you're not helping in, yeah. in reality like not it's then it's a difference between partaking and turning away like that's not the same thing um you cannot partake and not turn away as well you know um it doesn't have to be one or the other and I think that was what the the old church thought was either you have to dive into it or you have to totally. It's like no, like peep peep Yeshua, like yeah, the whole <laughs> the whole gospel is is very much um, the one thing he was rebuked for constantly was being around the the riffraff, you know, and so I think it's yeah, being a um, Oh, what does my pastor always say? Um, a, a something witness. Dang it. I'll think of it later. Not a prophetic witness, but a like an embodied witness or a, I don't know. I'll think of it at some point. I'll t send it to yeah. you. Well, yeah, um, or they call prophetic witness. That's sort of a term thrown around a lot in my circle. So, but it's, it's, um, that's why it's not prophetic witness. Um, it's 
it's it's more the the um what the mud the blood and the the mud the blood and the, the beer of whatever whatever that phrase is of life it's more the subtle and the grind and the um just being there um yeah instead of being the hyper spiritual christian that's around um yeah i don't know it's a word it's definitely a time to be alive for sure yeah yeah well it's it's and i think in terms of, of pointing to something i mean you know the the ultimate revelation of god is not it's not an experience it's not a a high or whatever it's a person which i think is is something you know that sort of idea is is something we could never you know fully reach the depths of because we mm. um you know to be known as we are known and 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 all of this stuff that that you know god most god maximally manifested itself as a person in the in the person of christ um and i think we we do we we manifest that spirit by being personal with people you know <laughs> totally. by by embodying that agape love and that 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 love that you know the father and the son and the spirit share within themselves as you know emulating the the divine community we emulate that as 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 the christian community and i think that points people um um you know not just like sort of in the in the church he's sort of way you were describing oh, earlier where the old church is sort of this this propositional tyranny like do this don't do this but it's more like um you've had all these experiences in your life let's let's figure out how do these how you know where might there be deception of course but also how does this point to this this one person who is the central figure of history and is the central yeah. figure of humanity yeah um so yeah um with with another thing i thought of with it's something i'm on about maybe uniquely um with love and with definitely i have a video of it check out the video and let me know what you think but um with divine love um we i think that the, the view of love meaning agape period is potentially an an uh unforeseen an unforeseen consequence of that perception of love has been this like distancing um like it's like like what like love love the sinner hate the sin or like um you know, like there mm. is some like, I love you, but like, I'm detached from you. Um, I'm of, I'm not of the world, but I'm in the world, whatever. To where, um, and in a subtle way, obviously, but when, you know, when philia is, is, is not involved in divine love, the friendship is not as important as it actually is when uh eros is not understood righteousness and and that being the beloved um is not understood um and then yeah i i and and with uh storgi as well you know there's um i have a nuance with that of strong storgi and weak storgi of um the the teacher or parent being that strong version of that love. And so that looks like being uh, discipling and, and that type of, you know, parental or, or mentorship. And then weak story is this, like uh, this posture of humility and not just posture of humility, but also a posture of like passion for learning um, and being coachable and, and that kind of thing. And then as humanity, that is like the 
the posture of humanity towards God. Um, mm. And then Philly is this, this equal hi- uh, hierarchy. Um, I get into a lot of that, but um, I can, it's, I, I see how that could subtly cause these things to be um, lesser. So we're just, we're just called to charity. And even that, um, I, would, I would define agape as less as charity and more as maybe empathy um, as well. Hmm. But when it's just agape, it's, it's not the fullness. Um, and it's, it's not in the mud and the blood of life, you know, um, ah, it's on the tip of my tongue. I almost had it. Something witness. I don't know. Sometime I'll think of it. Um, there's a great article I'll send to you. Let me grab it real quick. On the note of Thalia, um, it's called Faux Friendship by, you'll just have to read the name, I don't know. (laughs) Faux Friendship. Mm, Okay. I don't know if there's any website or anything. Um, This is important. a lot of what we're going through right now as a society right now, specifically, I think has to do with the death of friendship um, and Mm. of, of deep friendship. And especially, uh, especially with, with men. Um, Yeah. Especially so. Um, And it's very unfortunate, but it's also what happens when you don't value those things if you don't use it you lose it kind of thing i guess um yeah that yeah that's a a side whole whole rabbit trail Mm -hmm. but um i can see how that can that's it's a similar thing of like no embodying all of love and so being in next to that person and being with them um and so trying to embody that in this re-enchantment that's occurring i guess yeah which even i mean um and it seems like that's almost what you're doing when you're talking about earlier about being with there with your friends when they're you know having their trips or whatever yeah um totally like you know for me i i would have no idea what to do in that situation because i've never had um you know, had any experience with psychedelics, but sort of your unique position there is, is maybe being exactly what you're describing to, to them and sort of pointing them to, you know, in the right direction. And so with that, um, to potentially come against myself, um, the other side is also, uh, making sure that you're, in, you're remaining a witness, Yeah, you know? that it, that it still is witnessing and it's not just, uh, acquiescing to whatever they're doing and, and trying to put a spin on it or whatever. Um, and, and remaining, um, strong in, uh, in, in abstaining from what, uh, the Lord has, has commanded you to abstain from. And, um, yeah. Um, Yeah, it's definitely uh, difficult. It's it's harder, you know. Like yeah. you were saying earlier, it's it's a more difficult thing. But um, it's I think it's what we're not not the specifics of what the example we're talking about, but that type of thing is what we're called into. Um, I just that I'm stuck on trying to get that whatever that word is 
it's on the tip of my tongue. Yeah. Still, but someday we'll think of it. Yeah, someday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we've been going quite a while. I don't know if yeah. you want to think about wrapping up or word for sure. Um, you know, any, I don't know if you had anything to ask me. I've sort of been interrogating you most of the time, but um, I definitely, definitely want to talk to you in a more, another time in a more uh, reversed way of hearing your story. And how old are you? Uh, 23. See, that's what, yeah, that uh, you and, um, and Andrew as well, young guns. And I'm like, and I'm 28, almost 29. So I'm not that much older, but um I was surprised with you, especially that, that you were that young. Um, so you're definitely a very mature and, and um, uh, a, a pleasure to, to read your input whenever you do um, on the bridge. Um, so I appreciate it. And so I definitely would love to, to get to know your story a bit more for sure. Um, Thanks. That, yeah, that means a lot. <laughs> what with, with, with what I was saying with, how do you, I guess a final thing I would ask with, um, no, 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 no. I don't even ask that. <laughs> we'll save it for the next time. Sure. Okay. It's a whole, it's a whole road to walk down. I don't want to cut it yeah. short. So yeah. Yeah. Okay, man. Um, I think what I'll do if we're ready, I'll stop the recording. Word. Okay. Aloha.